Hello everyone, this is the 5th Ethical Revelation Fellowship Study Group and I'm Reverend Dr. Roger Paul and I'm here this morning with my wife uh, Reverend Diane Paul and Millie, Millie Williams and we may have some other people joining us on Skype. This morning is uh, May 4th, 2014 and this morning we're going to study paper 124 and the papers on Jesus and this is the later childhood of Jesus. So uh, we're going to have a short prayer and we'll get started. Here we go, some short prayer. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day. We come to you with longing in our hearts to understand more deeply the life of Jesus and to study the revelation from the Urantia book so that we can and others can discover the truth of how Jesus was raised and his life and the example that he was. We just thank you for this opportunity and we thank you for this day and we give all our gratitude through Jesus Christ Michael of Heaven. Amen. 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 Okay. The later childhood of Jesus. How about if I start out reading this morning? How's that? Slide. What page are we on? One We're on page uh, 1380, oh, I'm sorry, 1366. 13. Yeah, and it's paper 12401. Okay, the later childhood of Jesus. Although Jesus might have enjoyed a better opportunity for schooling at Alexandria than in Galilee, he could not have had such a splendid environment for working out his own problems with a minimum of educational guidance, at the same time enjoying the great advantage of constantly contacting with such a large number of all classes of men and women hailing from every part of the civilized world. Had he remained at Alexandria, his education would have been directed by Jews and along exclusively Jewish lines. At Nazareth, he secured an ed education and received a training, which more acceptably prepared him to understand the Gentiles, and which gave him a better and more balanced idea of the relative merits of the Eastern or Babylonian and the Western or Hellenic views of Hebrew theology. Now, why are they talking about Alexandria here? It's because they flee to Alexandria during the time of Herod, right? And uh, they thought about staying there in Alexandria because they had family and friends there. But they ended up coming back to Nazareth. So it would have been interesting if he would have been raised in Alexandria rather than Nazareth. Okay. Millie, would you take the next paragraph, please? Yes. <clears throat> One, Jesus' is ninth year, A.D. 3. Though it could hardly be said that Jesus was ever seriously ill, he did have some of the minor ailments of childhood this year, along with his brothers and baby sister. School went on, and he was still a favored pupil, having one week each month at Liberty, and he continued to divide his time about equally between trips to neighboring cities with his father, sojourns on his uncle's farm south of Nazareth, and finishing fishing excursions out from Magdala. Okay, that's good. You got two paragraphs, but that's all right. I was going to tell you to take another one anyway because that one was so short. All right, so he he had a pretty normal childhood, didn't he? You know, going around different places with his with his dad and his uncle, fishing and that sort of thing. Typical boyhood childhood, I guess, right? All right. The most serious trouble is yet to come up at school occurred in late winter when Jesus dared to challenge the chastened regarding the teaching that all images, pictures, and drawings were idolatrous in nature. Jesus delighted in drawing landscapes as well as in modeling a great variety of objects in potter's clay. Everything of that sort was strictly forbidden by Jewish law, but up to this time he had managed to disarm his parents' objection to such an extent that they had permitted him to continue in these activities. Okay, that's part of the, the 630 laws of Moses, right? And they were pretty bound up. Have you stopped? Uh, yeah, hang on just one second. Let me get to slide, slide straight right here. 
you know, it's interesting that he did get into drawing and, and so forth, but he didn't leave any of it. No, nope, he, he left didn't. nothing. Nothing of his, his... No. He enjoyed doing it, and he put, remember, he put plaques up on his walls for his brothers and sisters to read, but he went back and destroyed them all, didn't he? Want to make sure he... You remember Emmanuel's charge that he let leave nothing that could be, become idolatrous uh, when he left the planet? And that's probably part of that. He tried. he tried. They did find a shroud that they want to. Yeah, but you remember when we studied. Sure. The, uh, well, you weren't with us when we studied. The, we just studied the resurrection a couple of weeks ago at Easter, and it states that the burial cloth of Jesus were thrown over a cliff. That's what it says. So, if that's a shroud, it, according to the book, it shouldn't be Jesus's anyway. You know. So anyway, let's keep going. But trouble was again stirred up at school when one of the more backward pupils discovered Jesus drawing a charcoal picture of the teacher on the floor of the schoolroom. There it was, plain as day, and many of the elders had viewed it before the committee went to call on Joseph to demand that something be done to suppress the lawlessness of his eldest son. <laughs> and though it, this was not the first time complaints had come to Joseph and Mary about the doings of their versatile and aggressive child, it was the most serious of all the accusation which had thus been thus far been lodged against him. Jesus listened to the indictment of his artistic efforts for some time, being seated on a large stone just outside the back door. He resented them, their blaming his father for his alleged misdeeds, so he marched fearlessly confronting his accusers. The elders were thrown into confusion. Some were inclined to view this episode humorously, while one or two seemed to think the boy was sacrilegious, if not blasphemous. Joseph was nonplussed. Many indignant, but Mary. Mary was indignant, but Jesus insists on being heard. He had his say, courageously defending his viewpoint, and with consummate self-control announced that he would abide by the decision of his father, in this and all other matters controversial, just like he did God, right? and the committee of elders departed in silence. Good thing Jesus didn't grow up in this day, they'd have him on drugs, wouldn't they? <laughs> I mean, that's what we do with kids that, that are creative. That are creative right? <laughs> we try to calm them down because they're troublemakers, right? And that's still, uh, I mean, that's, that's the norm. I have a good friend that we had a long conversation about this the other day. Okay, uh, would you take the next one, Millie? Yes, Mary endeavored to influence Joseph to permit Jesus to model in clay at home, provided he promised not to carry on any of these questionable activities at school. But Joseph felt impelled to rule that the rabbinical interpretation of the second commandment should prevail. And so Jesus no more drew or modeled the likeness of anything from that day as long as he lived in his father's house. But he was unconvinced of the wrong of what he had done, and to give up such a favorite pastime constituted one of the greatest trials of his young life. That would be understandable, so it wouldn't be. It'd be internal conflict. It, yeah, internal <coughs> conflict because you want to do what your father tells you to do, and yet uh, um, you 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 give up one of your favorite things you do, right? You want to take the next one? In the latter part of June. Jesus, in company with his father, first climbed to the summit of Mount Tabor. It was a clear day, and the view was superb. It seemed to this nine-year-old lad that he had really gazed upon the entire world, excepting India, Africa, and Rome. Looking out over the mountains, right? What we do at Stone Mountain, right? Yeah. Get up there. <laughs> Looking out. Well. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Jesus' second sister, Martha, was born Thursday night, September 13th. Three weeks after the coming of Martha, Joseph, who was home for a while, started the building of an additional addition to their house, a combined workshop and bedroom. A smart, small workbench was built for Jesus, and for the first time he possessed tools of his own. At odd times for many years he worked at this bench and became highly expert in the making of, of yokes. And that's no yoke, right? Yoke is good. All right. You want to take the next one, uh, Millie? 
This winter and the next were the coldest in Nazareth for many decades. Jesus had seen snow on the mountains, and several times it had fallen in Nazareth, remaining on the ground only a short time. But not until this winter had he seen ice. The fact that water could be had as a solid, a liquid, and a vapor, he had long pondered over the escaping steam from the boiling pots, caused the lad to think a great deal about the physical world and its constitution. And yet, the personally embodied... Body, yeah, that's Personality. Right. Personality. <laughs> the personality embodied in this growing youth was all this while the actual creator and organizer of all these things throughout the far-flung universe. That is interesting, isn't it? He, he fa finds it fascinating. He created it. <laughs> uh. The climate of Nazareth was not severe. January was the coldest month, the temperature averaging around 50 degrees Fahrenheit. During July and August, the hottest months, the temperature would vary from 75 to 90 degrees Fahrenheit. From the mountains to the Jordan and the Dead Sea Valley, the climate of Palestine ranged from the frigid to the torrid. And so, in a way, the Jews were prepared to live in about any and all of the world's varying climates. That is interesting that uh, most people live in a climate similar, isn't it? I mean, most large populations. You know, that we live in uh, places where it's at least amicable, you know, it, it, it's at least nice to live there, right? Even during the warmest summer months, cool breeze usually blew from the west from 10, 10 a.m. till about 10 p.m. Now, every now and then, but every now and then, terrific hot winds from the eastern desert would blow across all Palestine. These hot blasts usually came in February and March near the end of the rainy season. In those days, the rain fell in refreshing showers from November to April, but it did not rain steadily. There were only two seasons in Palestine, summer and winter, the dry and the rainy seasons. In January, the flowers began to bloom, and by end of April, the whole land was one vast flower garden. Isn't that interesting? We're studying this right during that same time. <laughs> It's nice because it gives you the visual of what he was, yeah. where he lived. And, yeah, it does. Millie, would you take the next one? Mm-hmm. Um, does it start in May? Yes, ma'am. In May of this year, on his uncle's farm, Jesus, for the first time, helped with the harvest of the grain. Before he was 13, he had managed to find out something about practically everything that men and women worked at around Nazareth, except metalworking. And he spent several months in a smith's shop when older, after his father, the death of his father. Oops, I forgot to change this. All right. Um, you know, it's kind of interesting that Jesus even eventually worked uh, and as a metalsmith, he tried all kinds of work. You don't think about that, do you? When work and caravan travel were slack, Jesus made many trips with his father on pleasure or business to nearby Cana, Endor, and Nain. Even as a lad, he frequently visited Sephora's, only a little over three miles from Nazareth to the northwest, and from 4 B.C. to about A.D. 25, the capital of Galilee, and one of the residents of Herod Antipas. So this was, Sephoris was the capital of Galilee, and I've stuck some slides in here to kind of show you what it looks like today. This is the remains of Sephoris, okay, and, and it, during that time it was the capital of Galilee. And they have some interesting things in this. Uh, let me read my notes from here. Okay, this was... Uh, I have noted here, Joseph, this is one of the buildings in Sephora's, Joseph, you know, Jesus' father, may be hit, may have been hit by one of these falling stones. You know, so you can see why he got injured, right? Alright. Alright, under this one, on Encyclopedia Urantia, he has mentioned, uh, Flibrous courtesans may have paraded about on the Carbo, north and south oriented main street of Sephora. So this was the main street of Sephora. Shows what it looks like. Isn't that interesting? Can you get a little bit different perspective? Okay. 
Jesus continued to grow physically, intellectually, socially, and spiritually. His trips away from home did not much give him a better, a better and more generous understanding of his own family, and by the time even his parents were beginning to learn from him as well as to teach him, Jesus was an original thinker and a skillful teacher, even in his youth. He was a, in constant collision with the so-called oral law, but he always sought to adapt himself to the practices of the family. He got along fairly well with the children of his age, but he often grew discouraged with their slow-acting minds. Before he was ten years old, he had become the leader of a group of seven lads who formed themselves into a society for promoting the requirements of manhood, physical, intellectual, and religious. Among these boys, Jesus succeeded in introducing many new games and various improved methods of physical recreation. Now think about this. Um, we have the same problems in our society today that Jesus had in that people do not like new concepts, do they? They don't like change. And what Jesus dealt with, with these slow thinkers, uh, we're dealing with in the communities, like many of them Christian, that have this idea of what Christianity is, like the Jews did back then, right? They, everything is set in stone to them, right? It was set in stone to the Jews. And many Christian groups have done the same thing. They have taken whatever's in the Bible and say, that's the last word on the subject. So this revelation is what? This revelation is dangerous to them because it has to change their thinking, don't they? And they have to ex expand their concepts. So that's why we get such a resistance sometimes when we start talking to Christians about this new revelation of the life of Jesus. And, and, and you can think about it. The paragraph we, we just read, Jesus dealt with the same thing, didn't he? The exact same thing. Okay. Next. Millie, would you take the next paragraph? The tenth year, A.D. 4. It was the 5th of July, the first Sabbath of the month, when Jesus, while strolling through the countryside with his father, first gave expression to feelings and ideas which indicated that he was becoming self-conscious of the unusual nature of his life mission. Joseph listened attentively to the momentous words of his son, but made few comments. He volunteered no information. The next day, Jesus had a similar but long, longer talk with his mother. Mary likewise listened to the pronouncements of the lad, but neither did she volunteer any information. It was almost two years before Jesus again spoke to his parents concerning this increasing revelation within his own consciousness regarding the nature of his personality and the character of his mission on earth. So he was 10 years old when he first started the realization of who he was before, right? Which is kind of interesting. That's kind of young, isn't it? Hard. It would be hard to listen to a 10-year-old and uh, suddenly find out that he's come, becoming self-aware of his own divinity. Well, that would be odd, wouldn't it? <coughs> All right. He entered the advanced school of the synagogue in August. At school, he was constantly creating trouble by the questions he persisted in asking. Increasingly, he kept all Nazareth in more or less of a hubbub. His parents were, were loath to forbid his asking these disquieting questions, and his chief teacher was greatly intrigued by the lad's curiosity, insight, and hunger for knowledge. It's because he, it, it, everybody could not keep up with his brain. <coughs> I bet Tesla had a really hard time in school, too. Yeah, I bet he did, too. Well, you know, not only Tesla, but people like Einstein also. You know, that's why they made terrible grades, because they couldn't concentrate on, you know, stupid doing. stuff, you know. Jesus' playmate saw nothing supernatural about his conduct. In most ways, he was altogether like themselves. His interest in study was somewhat above average, but not wholly unusual. He did ask more questions at school than others in his class. So he was your typical curious kid. Wasn't he? All right, Millie, would you take the next one? Perhaps his most unusual and outstanding trait was his willingness to fight for his rights. 
Since he was such a well-developed lad for his age, it seemed strange to his playfellows that he was disinclined to defend himself even from injustice or when subjected to personal abuse. As it happened, he did not suffer much on account of this trait because of the friendship of Jacob, a neighbor boy who was one year older. He was the son of a stonemason, a business associate of Joseph. Jacob was a great admirer of Jesus and made it his business to see that no one was permitted to impose upon Jesus because of his aversion to physical combat. Several times, older and uncouth young youths attacked Jesus, relying upon his reputed docility, but they always suffered swift and certain retribution at the hands of his self-appointed champion and every ever ready defender, Jacob, the stonemason's son. And that interesting, and Jacob ended up uh, marrying one of Jesus' sister later on, doesn't he? Yeah, Jacob and Leah. Jesus was the generally accepted leader of the Nazareth lads who stood for the higher ideals of their day and generation. He was really loved by his youthful associates, not only because he was fair, but also because he possessed a rare and understanding sympathy that betokened love and bordered on discreet compassion. You know, before we get off that last paragraph, there is one thing I want to mention. Um, you know, Jesus' lack of defending himself, think about this, if he was becoming self-aware, you can see why under no circumstances would he ever do that. Why? Because these are all his children, right? So he would never hurt or abuse one of his own creation. You know. So, you know, people say, Well, why didn't he ever defend himself? Well he he as a as a creator he couldn't, could he? You know, that would not be right, you know. That would be using his abilities uh, inappropriately, right? And he couldn't really hurt people too. That's right. In a different way. He, he, he would This year he began to show a marked preference for the company of older persons. He delighted in talking over things cultural, educational, social, economic, political, and religious with older minds, and his depth of reasoning and keenness of observation so charmed his adult associates that they were always more than willing to visit with him. Until he became responsible for the support of the, of the home, his parents were constantly seeking to influence him to associate with those of, of his own age, or more nearly his age, rather than the older and better informed individuals from, from whom he evinced such a preference. preference. And this is just a picture of Jesus at the work table with his father. Late this year, he had a fishing experience with, of two months with his uncle on the Sea of Galilee, and he was very successful. Before attaining manhood, he had become an expert fisherman. All right. And later he turned that into what? A fisher of men. <laughs> right. All right. His physical development continued. He was an advanced and privileged pupil at school. He got along fairly well at home with his younger brothers and sisters having the advantage of being three and one-half years older than the oldest of the other children. He was well thought of in Nazareth except by the parents of some of the duller children, who often spoke of Jesus as being too pert, as lacking in proper humility and youthful reserve. He manifested a growing tendency to direct the play activities of his youthful associates into more serious and thoughtful channels. He was a born teacher and simply could not refrain from so functioning even when supposedly engaged in play. So he was born a leader, wasn't he? Jo Joseph early began to instruct Jesus in the diverse means of gaining a livelihood, explaining the advantages of agriculture over industry and trade. Galilee was a more beautiful and prosperous district than Judea, and, and it cost only about one-fourth as much to live there as, it, as in Jerusalem and Judea. It was a province of agricultural villages and thriving industrial cities containing more than 200 towns 
of over 5,000 population and 30 of over 15,000. So there's some pretty good sized cities there, weren't they? Okay. Millie, would you take the next one? When on his first trip with his father to observe the fishing industry on the Lake of Galilee, Jesus had just about made up his mind to become a fisherman. But close association with his father's vocation later on in influenced him to become a carpenter, while still later a combination of influences led him to the final choice of becoming a religious teacher of a new order. All right. So he, it was his, his father's influence that helped influence him to become a carpenter because his dad was a carpenter, right? And that's what they he did when they were growing up, right? So let's move on to the 11th year. 3, the 11th year, A.D. 5. Throughout this year, the lad continued to make trips away from home with his father, but he also frequently visited the uncle's farm and occasionally went over to Magdala's to engage in fishing with the uncle who made his headquarters near that city. So he liked to go to this, this farm, just like all, all children. They like to go to the farm and see the animals and all that sort of thing, right? right? Joseph and Mary were often tempted to show some special, I'm sorry, favoritism for Jesus and otherwise to betray their knowledge that he was a child of promise, a son of destiny. But both of his parents were extraordinarily wise and sagacious in these matters. The few times they did in any manner exhibit any preference for him, even in the slightest degree, the lad was quick to refuse all such special consideration. Millie, hmm. really? you take the next one? Jesus spent considerable time at the caravan supply shop and by conversing with the travelers from all parts of the world, he acquired a store of information about international affairs that was amazing considering his age. This was the last year in which he enjoyed much free play and youthful joyousness. From this time on, difficulties and responsibilities rapidly multiplied in the life of this youth. So things got serious rather quickly, didn't they? On Wednesday evening, June 24, 85, Jude was born. Complications attended the birth of this, the seventh child. Mary was so very ill for several weeks that Joseph remained at home. Jesus was very much occupied with errands for his father and with many duties occasioned by his mother's serious illness. Never again did this youth, did this youth find it possible to return to the childlike attitude of his earlier years. From the time of his mother's illness, just before he was 11 years old, he was compelled to assume the responsibilities of the firstborn son, and to do all this one or two full years before these burdens should normally have fallen on his shoulders. So responsibility came, came uh, upon him really quickly, didn't it? It started out with the illness of Mary. Okay. The Shazaran spent one evening each week with Jesus, helping him to master the Hebrew scriptures. He was greatly interested in the progress of his promising pupil, therefore he was willing to assist him in many ways. This Jewish pedagogue exerted a great influence upon his growing mind, but he was never able to comprehend why Jesus was so different to all of his suggestions regarding the prospects of going to Jerusalem to continue his education under the learned rabbis. So he didn't sh show any interest in doing this. It's, it, it's almost like he knew that he would never have that, op really have that opportunity to go. All right. <coughs> really? About the middle of May, the lad accompanied his father on a business trip to, whoa, Scythopolis. The chief city, Greek city of the Decapolis, the ancient Hebrew city of Beth Sheen. On the way, Joseph recounted much of the olden history of King Saul, the Philistines, and the subsequent events of Israel's turbulent history. 
Jesus was tremendously impressed with the clean appearance and well-ordered arrangement of this so-called heathen city. He marveled at the open-air theater and admired the beautiful marble temple dedicated to the worship of the heathen gods. Joseph was much perturbed by the lad's enthusiasm and sought to counteract these favorable impressions by extolling the beauty and grandeur of the Jewish temple in Jerusalem. Jesus had often gazed curiously upon this magnificent Greek city from the hill at Nazareth and had many times inquired about its extensive public works and ornate buildings, but his father had always sought to avoid answering the questions. Now they were face to face with the beauties of this Gentile city, and Joseph could not gracefully ignore Jesus' inquiries. So he was a curious lad and, and impressed by the beauty of these th cities, right? Okay. And this, this is one of the um, pictures, or um, oh, what are they called? On, the, on, on one of the walls in the city. Uh, and the next one is, this is a, a picture of the courtyard, or the uh, uh, open air theater um, there. This makes it a little more interesting. It's so tiny. Huh? It's so tiny. Yeah. <laughs> All right. It so happened that just at this time, the annual competitive games and public demonstrations of physical prowess between the Greek cities of Decapolis were in progress at the Sothopolis uh -huh. Amphitheater. Amphitheater. And Jesus was insistent that his father take him to see the games. And he was so insistent that Joseph hesitated to deny him. The boy was thrilled with the games and entered most heartily into the spirit of the demonstrations of physical development and athletic skill. Joseph was inexpressibly shocked to observe his son's enthusiasm as he beheld these exhibitions of heathen vaingloriousness. After the games were finished, Joseph received the surprise of his life when he heard Jesus express his approval of them and suggest that it would be good for the young men of Nazareth if they could be thus benefited by wholesome outdoor physical activities. Joseph talked earnestly and long with Jesus concerning the evil nature of such practices, but he well knew that the lad was unconvinced. Okay, and this next picture is a picture of the games that went on there. You can see on the side of a, uh, of a pot. Um, and that's what uh, they went to watch. Now, why do you think they thought these games were heathen and vaingloriousness? Because they built up their own bodies, right? Mm -hmm. And they did it to, to improve themselves. And of course, that was not in the Jewish heritage, heritage was it? So the whole the concept the whole of... The concept of self-glorification. And competitiveness. And competitive, competitiveness, right. <clears throat> the only reason they did anything like that was for what? War, right? <clears throat> okay. The only time Jesus, Jesus ever saw his father angry with him was that night in their room in the inn when the course of their discussions the boy so forgot the trends of Jewish thought as to suggest that they go back home and, and work for the building of an amphitheater in, in Nazareth. When Joseph heard his firstborn sons express such un-Jewish sentiments, he forgot his usual calm demeanor and seized Jesus by the shoulder, angrily, angrily exclaimed, My son, never again let me hear you give utterance to such an evil thought as long as you live. Jesus was startled by his father's display of emotion. He had never before been made to feel that the personal sting of his father's indig indignation and was astonished and shocked beyond expression. He only replied, very well my father, it shall be so. And never again did the boy even in the slightest manner allude to the games or other uh, athletic activities of the Greeks as long as the father lived. So he always followed his father's wishes to the, to the letter, didn't he? Okay. Later on, Jesus saw the Greek amphitheater at Jerusalem and learned how hateful such things were from the Jewish point of view. Nevertheless, throughout his life, he endeavored to introduce the idea of wholesome recreation into his personal plans and, as far as Jewish practice would permit, into the later program of regular activities for his twelve apostles. Remember 
remember they took off one day a week to see their families and play and, and, rec and for recreation, right? right? At the end of, it, of this 11th year, Jesus was a vigorous, well-developed, moderately humorous, and fairly light-hearted youth. From this year on, he was more and more given to peculiar seasons of profound meditation and serious contemplation. He was much given to thinking about how he was to carry out his obligations to his family, and at the same time be obedient to the call of his mission to the world. Already he had conceived that his ministry was not to be limited to the betterment of the Jewish people. So as a young man, he realized that his, his mission was for everyone, not just the Jews, right? That must have been a, uh, a, a quite a revelation to him, think, coming from a Jewish family, right? The twelfth year, A.D. 6. This was the eventful year in Jesus' life. He continued to make progress at school and was... What is that? Indefatigable. Indefatigable in his study of nature, while increasingly he prosecuted his study of the methods whereby men make a living. He began doing regular work at, at the home carpentry shop and was permitted to manage his own earnings a very unusual arrangement to obtain in a Jewish family. This year he also learned the wisdom of keeping such matters a secret in the family. He was becoming conscious of the way in which he had caused trouble in the village and henceforth he became increasingly discreet in concealing everything which might cause him to be regarded as different from his fellows. Because as he got, got older that would really stand out, right? Millie, would you take the next one? Throughout this year, he experienced many seasons of uncertainty, if not actual doubt, regarding the nature of his mission. He naturally developed human mind, did not yet fully grasp the reality of his dual nature. The fact that he had a single personality rendered it difficult for his conscious, consciousness to recognize the double origin of those factors which composed the nature associated with that self-same personality. And what are they talking about? His pre-existence, his deity personality, and his human side, right? Yes. That was a time that he would have been going through puberty. Oh yeah, I think that everything was changing, right? <laughs> um, from youth onward. Okay. From this time on, he became more successful and getting along with his brothers and sisters. He was increasingly tactful, always compassionate and considerate of their welfare and happiness, and enjoyed good relations with them up to the beginning of his public ministry. To be more explicit, he got along with James, Miriam, and the two younger, as yet unborn children, Amos and Ruth, most excellently. He always got along with Martha fairly well. What trouble he had at home largely arose out of his friction with Joseph and Jude, particularly the latter. We're going to find out more about that later on, won't we? Okay. It was a trying experience for Joseph and Mary to undertake the rearing of this unprecedented combination of divinity and humanity, and they deserve great credit for so faithfully and successfully discharging their parent, parental responsibilities. Increasingly, Jesus' parents re realized that there was something superhuman resident within this eldest son, but they never even faintly dreamed that this son of promise was indeed and in truth the actual creator of the local universe of things and beings. Jesus and Mary lived and died without ever learning that their son Jesus really was the universe creator incarnate in mortal flesh. Yeah, I think that would not be a good thing for them to know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Do you think? <laughs> uh, of course, that would make you a little more responsible, I think, wouldn't it? Uh, You've all gone all fuzzy and out of focus. Oh, have I? It's probably my camera over there. Uh, my Skype camera. All right. Billy, would you take the next one? This year, Jesus paid more attention than ever to music and he continued to teach the homeschool for his brothers and sisters. It was at about this time 
that the lad became keenly conscious of the difference between the viewpoints of Joseph and Mary regarding the nature of his mission. He pondered much over his parents' differing opinions, often hearing their discussion when they thought he was sound asleep. More and more he inclined to the view of his father so that his mother was destined to be hurt by the realization that her son was gradually rejecting her guidance in matters having to do with his life career. And as the years passed, this breach of understanding widened. Less and less did Mary comprehend the significance of Jesus' mission, and increasingly was this good mother hurt by the failure of her favorite son to fulfill her fond expectations. So she was, she was bound by disappointment, to be disappointed, wasn't she? Because it was not working out the way she expected. Right. Joseph entertained a growing belief in the spiritual nature of Jesus' mission. And but for other and more important reasons, it does seem unfortunate that he could not have lived to see the fulfillment of his concept of Jesus' bestowal on earth. I wonder if he watched it from the mansion world. You ever wonder that? Okay, during this last year at school, when he was 12 years old, Jesus remonstrated with his father about the Jewish custom of touching the bit of parchment nailed upon the doorpost each time on going into or coming out of the house, and then kissing the finger that touched the parchment. Remember that in, in uh, uh, the Ten Commandments and in Ben-Hur, you know, touch it. All right. As a part of this ritual, it was customary to say, The Lord shall preserve our going out and coming in from this time forth and even forevermore. Joseph and Mary had repeatedly instructed Jesus as to the reasons for not making images or drawing pictures, explaining that such creations might be used for adulterous purposes. Though Jesus failed fully to grasp their uh, prescriptions against images and pictures, he possessed a high concept of consistency and therefore pointed out to his father the uh, essentially adulterous nature of his habitual obscience to the doorpost parchment. And Joseph removed the parchment after Jesus had thus remonstrated with him. So he, he said, well, if that's the case, what we do every day coming out and going in, this ritual of touching the, the the doorpost was idolatrous also, right? And he was right. Okay. As time passed, Jesus did much to modify their practice of religious forms, such as the family prayers and other customs, and it was possible to do many such things at Nazareth for its synagogue was under the influence of a liberal school of rabbis, exemplified by the renowned Nazareth teacher, Jose. Throughout this and the two following years, Jesus suffered great mental distress as a result of the constant effort to adjust his personal views of religious practices and social amenities to the established beliefs of his parents. He was distraught by the conflict between the urge to be loyal to his own convictions and the conscientious admonition of dutiful submission to his parents. His supreme conflict was between two great commands which were uppermost in his youthful mind. The one was, be loyal to the dictates of your highest convictions of truth and righteousness. The other was, honor your father and mother, for they have given you life and the nurture thereof. However, he never shirked the responsibility of making the necessary daily adjustments between these realms of loyalty to one's personal convictions and duty towards one's family, and he achieved the satisfaction of effecting an increasingly harmonious blending of personal convictions and family obligations into a masterful concept of group solidarity based upon loyalty, fairness, tolerance, and love. So he tried to do what his parents uh, wanted him to do uh, as much as possible, right? But it caused a problem between that him and his own convictions. Okay. Five, his 13th year, A.D. 7. In this year, the lad of Nazareth passed from boyhood to the beginning of young manhood. His voice began to change, and other features of mind and body gave evidence of the oncoming status of manhood. 
reaching puberty, right? All right, Millie, would you take the next one? On Sunday night, January 9, AD 7, his baby brother Amos was born. Jude was not yet two years of age, and the baby sister Ruth was yet to come. So it may seem, may be seen that Jesus had a sizable family of small children left to his watch care when his father met his accidental death the following year. Okay, and that was his 13th year. This is the start of his 13th year, right? Okay. It was about the middle of February that Jesus became humanly assured that he was destined to, to perform a mission on earth for the enlightenment of man and the revelation of God. Momentous decisions coupled with far-reaching plans were formulating in the mind of this youth who was to outward appearances an average Jewish lad of Nazareth. The intelligent life of all Nebadon looked on with fascination and amazement as all this began to unfold in the thinking and acting of the now adolescent carpenter's son. Okay, now, do you catch that sentence in there? The intelligent life of all Nebadon looked on with fascination and amazement? So what does that make you think? It makes you think that the universal broadcast was broadcasting this whole life of Jesus to the rest of the universe, right? Does that make sense? At least that's the impression I get from this, anyway. What do you all think? Oh, definitely. Yeah. Definitely. That's the first mention. Yeah. On the first day of the week, March 20, A.D. 7, Jesus graduated from the course of training in the local school connected with the Nazareth synagogue. So he was 13, right? This was a great day in the life of any ambitious Jewish family. The day when their first foreign son was pronounced a son of the commandment and ransomed firstborn of the Lord God of Israel, a child of the Most High and servant of the Lord of all the earth. You notice here they put ransomed firstborn, the sacrificial lamb concept. There, see that? It's in the it's in the culture of, of our society. Right. <sighs> Millie, you want to take the next one? Friday of the week before, Joseph had come over from Sephoris, where he was in charge of a work on a new public building, to be present for this glad occasion. Jesus' teacher confidently believed that his alert and diligent pupil was destined to do some outstanding career, some distinguished mission. The elders, notwithstanding all their trouble with Jesus' nonconformist tendencies, were very proud of the lad and had already begun laying plans which would enable him to go to Jerusalem and continue his education in the renowned Hebrew academies. Okay, and just so y'all would know what that looks like, I included a picture. This is the road to Sephora. All right. <laughs> uh, so you know what it looks like. Okay. As Jesus heard these plans discussed from time to time, he became increasingly sure that he would never go to Jerusalem to study with the rabbis. But he little dreamed of the tragedy so soon to occur, which would ensure the abandonment of all such plans by causing him to assume the responsibility for the support and direction of a large family, presently to consist of five brothers and three sisters, as well as his mother and himself. Jesus had a larger and longer experience rearing his family than was accorded to Joseph, his father, and he did measure up to the standard which he subsequently set for himself, to become a wise, patient, understanding, and effective teacher, and eldest brother to this family. His family, so suddenly sorrow-stricken, and so unexpectedly debris. Okay, so Debrief. Jesus knew that he wasn't going to Jerusalem first. But what else is important in this? First, it, it spells out how many brothers and sisters Jesus actually had, right? He had five brothers and three sisters. So Mary had nine children, right? Nine children. Five brothers and three sisters. So for people, anybody that, did, that wondered that, there it is spelled out for you. Let's keep going. Oh, that's, I'm not that right. The journey to Jerusalem. 
Jesus, having now reached the threshold of young manhood, and having been formally graduated from the synagogue schools, was qualified to proceed to Jerusalem with his parents to participate with them in the celebration of the first Passover. The Passover feast of the year fell on Saturday, April 9, A.D. 7. A considerable company, 103, made ready to depart from Nazareth early Monday morning, April 4, for Jerusalem. They journeyed south uh, towards Samaria, but on reaching Jezreel, they turned east going around Mount Gilboa into the Jordan Valley in order to avoid passing through Samaria. Joseph and his family would have enjoyed a going, going down through Samaria by way of the Jacob's well and Bethel, but since the Jews disliked to deal with the Samaritans, they decided to go with their neighbors by way of the Jordan Valley. And I have two pictures of this for y'all to look at. This is the first one. This is from um, uh, Encyclopedia Urantia. It, 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 it breaks down the uh, trip and has some, some comments on it. Y'all can look that up later. And the other one is the map I put together, tracing where they where they left and where they ended up. And this is uh, map number four, and uh, it, it traces by date uh, the stops they made on the way down to Jerusalem. And you can look that up later too. Both of these are on the website too. Uh, uh, First, Fifth Epical Revelation Fellowship under Maps. Okay. The much. Am I still on? No. no. Millie, is that? Millie? Did you? The much dreaded Oculus had been deposed and they had little to fear in taking Jesus to Jerusalem. Twelve years had passed since the first Herod had sought to destroy the babe of Bethlehem, and no one would now think of a son of Nazareth. Okay, we lost you there for a second. Uh, no one would think of association that affair with an obscure lad of Nazareth. We lost your last sentence there for a second, Millie. Okay, so remember uh, Herod tried to have him killed, and they, they uh, went to Alexandria? That's what they're talking about here. So that's... That, his successor would not think about, you know, it's been too long, they thought that he was dead, right? Okay. Before reaching the Jezreel Junction, and as they journeyed on, very soon on the left they passed the ancient village of Shun, and Jesus heard again about the most beautiful maiden of all Israel, who once lived there and also went about the wonderful works of Elijah performed there. In passing by Jezreel, Jesus' parents recount, recounted the doings of Ahab and Jezebel and the exploits of Jehu. 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 Yeah. In passing around Mount Gilboa, they talked about they talked much about Saul and took his life on the slopes and took his life on the slopes of this mountain, King David and the associations of this historic spot. So much of their Jewish heritage and, and uh, history came from the same area, okay? And that includes uh, uh, all of the, basically all the name all the way down to uh, Jerusalem. Okay, and that's another picture of that. All right. Okay, we're good. As they rounded the base of Galboa, the pilgrims could see the Greek city of Thothopolis on the right. They gazed upon the marble structures from a distance and went on and, but went not near the Gentile city, lest they should so defile themselves that they could not participate in the forthcoming solemn and sacred ceremonies of the Passover at Jerusalem. Mary could not understand why neither Joseph nor Jesus would speak of Stathopolis. She did not know about their controversy of the previous year, as they, they, they had never revealed their episode to her. So... Why would they not go into the city? Because if they touched anything in the city, they weren't allowed to go into the, the uh, temple, right? Because they would have been defiled, all right? But what are they talking about this controversy of the previous year? We're talking about uh, when they went to see the games and Jesus and his father, uh, Jesus' father got upset with him, aren't they? That's what they're 
talking about there. And so they never told his mother about it, and neither one of them would mention it. So once they settled something, that was it. Okay. The road now led immediately down into the tropical Jordan Valley, and soon Jesus was to have exposed to his wonderful, wondering gaze the crooked, crooked and ever-winding Jordan with its glistening and rippling waters as it flowed down toward the Dead Sea. They laid aside their outer garments as they journeyed south in this tropical valley, enjoying the luxurious fields of grain and the beauty, beautiful Olander light laden with the pink blossoms, while massive snow-capped Mount Hermon stood far to the north in majestic and majest, majesty looking down on the historic, historic valley. A little over three hours travel from opposite Sothopolis, Sothopolis, they came upon a bubbling spring, and here they camped for the night out under the starlit heavens. Sounds like a beautiful trip, doesn't it? On their second day's journey, they passed by where Jabbok from the east flows into the Jordan. And looking east up this river valley, they recounted the days of Gideon when the Midianites poured into this region to overrun the land. Toward the end of the second day's journey, they camped near a base of the highest mountain overlooking the Jordan Valley, Mount Sartaba whose summit was occupied by the Alexandrian fortress where Herod had imprisoned one of his wives and buried his two strangled sons. Well, I'll tell you what, the leaders of that day sure got themselves some messes all the time, didn't they? The third day they passed by two villages, huh? Oh, sorry. The third day they passed by two villages which had been recently built by Herod and noted, the, noted their superior architecture and their beautiful palm gardens. By nightfall, they reached Jericho, where they remained until the morrow. That evening, Joseph, Mary, and Jesus walked a mile and a half to the side of the ancient Jericho, where Joshua, for whom Jesus was named, had performed his renowned exploits, according to Jewish tradition. Okay. Following the walls of Jericho? <laughs> Okay, by the fourth and last day's journey, the road was a continuous procession of pilgrims. They now began to climb the hills leading up to Jerusalem. As they neared the top, they could look across the Jordan to the mountains beyond and south over the sluggish waters of the Dead Sea. About halfway up to Jerusalem, Jesus gained his first view of the Mount of Olives, the region to be so much a part of his, of his subsequent life. And Joseph pointed out to him that the holy city lay just beyond this ridge, and the lad's heart beat fast with joyous anticipations as of soon beholding the city in the house of his heavenly father. So he was excited to see it, right? Okay, and this is first of many pictures I have online. This is a map uh, today of Jerusalem and the temple looking from above. And you can look at these online too under maps under for fifth epic origin like revelation.com but this shows the holy of holies the temple porch and uh, the discussion on, on the group steps and the dates associated with that and this is the overlook on the jericho road they're talking about okay as they come in it's, it's marked on the map also i have another picture right after this this is a rendition of Jerusalem during that time, okay, uh, and this is the, the temple and, and all the surrounding structures and stuff, the important things that happen. And you can find this one on uh, encyclopedia.com. Okay. On the eastern slopes of Olivet, they paused for rest in the border of a little village called Bethany. 
the hospitable villagers poured forth to minister to the pilgrims. And it happened that Joseph and his family had stopped near the house of one Simon, who had three children about the same age as Jesus, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. They invited the Nazareth family in for refreshments, and a lifelong friendship sprang up between the two families. Many times afterward, in this eventful life, Jesus stopped at this home. Okay, so this was Simon. Simon was Lazarus, the one that was raised from the dead. This was his father, right? And this is when they were young. So this is the first time, probably, that the, these two families met together. And next is a picture of Bethany to the right. You see this, I, I don't know if you can see this as I circle it, but Bethany is this little village uh, to the right of, of Palestine. I mean, uh, Jerusalem. Yeah, right. Okay. Pressed on, soon standing on the brink of Olivet, and Jesus saw for the first time in his memory the holy city, the pretentious palaces, and the inspiring temple of his father. At no time in his life did Jesus ever experience such a purely human thrill as that which at this time so completely enthralled him as he stood there on this April afternoon on the Mount of Olives, drinking in his first view of Jerusalem. And in after years, on the same spot, he stood and wept over the city which was about to reject another prophet, the last and the greatest of her heavenly teachers. Okay, and I have another picture of Jerusalem and what it would have looked like during that period of time. And it's got subscriptors and stuff on this one. And this one's on the Encyclopedia Uranch also. You can go out there and look these up, look at all the different locations. But they hurried on to Jerusalem, and it was now Thursday afternoon. On reaching the city, they journeyed past the temple, and never had Jesus beheld such throngs of human beings. He meditated deeply on how those Jews had assembled here from the uttermost parts of the world. Okay. Then. Soon they reached the place prearranged for accommodation during the Passover week the large home of a well-to-do relative of Mary's, one who knew something of the early history of both John and Jesus through Zacharias. The following day, the day of preparation, they made ready for the appropriate celebrations of the Passover Sabbath. It's interesting how many people secretly knew about the, uh, the, uh, the apparent mission of Jesus, isn't it? You know, in uh, Mary's family and stuff. Okay. Misunderstood. But misunderstood what it was. Yeah. While all Jerusalem was stir in preparation for the Passover, Joseph found time to take his son around to visit the academy where it had been arranged for him to resume his education two years later, as soon as he reached the required age of 15. Joseph was truly puzzled when he observed how little interest Jesus evinced in all these carefully laid plans. Probably because he knew he would never do this, right? Jesus was profoundly impressed by the temple and all the associated services and other activities. For the first time since he was four years old, he was too much preoccupied with his own meditations to ask many questions. He did, however, ask his father several embarrassing questions, as he had on previous occasions, as to why the Heavenly Father required the slaughter of so many innocent, helpless animals. And his father well knew from the expression on the lad's face that his answer and attempts to explanation were unsatisfactory to this deep-thinking and keen-reasoning son. Because he knew, in essence, it was wrong, right? Millie, would you take the next one? On the day before the Passover Sabbath, flood tides of spiritual illumination swept through the mortal mind of Jesus and filled his human heart to overflowing with affectionate pity for the spiritually blind and morally ignorant multitudes assembled for the celebration of the ancient Passover commemoration. This was one of the most extraordinary days that the Son of God spent in the flesh. 
And during the night, for the first time in his earth career, there appeared to him an assigned messenger from Salvington, commissioned by Emmanuel, who said, the hour has come, it is time that you begin to be about your father's business. And how old is he? 12. 13. 13. 13. That's right. So in his 13th year, uh, Emmanuel sent a messenger from Salvington stating that it was time for him to start his, to be about his father's business. That's, that's pretty, pretty young, isn't it? Okay. And so even ere the heavy responsibilities of the Nazareth family descended upon his youthful shoulders, there now arrived a celestial messenger to remind this lad not quite 13 years of age, but the hour had come to begin the re resumption of the responsibilities of a universe. This was the first act of a long succession of events which finally cul culminated in the completion of the sun's bestowal on Urantia and the replacing of the government of the universe on its human divine shoulders. So as far as the universe is concerned, this, this is when it's, it's stuck. His responsibility started as what? part of his sovereignty of the universe, right? Okay. As time passed, the mystery of the Incarnation became to all of us more and more unfathomable. We could hardly comprehend that this lad of Nazareth was the creator of all Nebanon. Neither do we nowadays understand how the spirit of this same Creator Son and the spirit of the Paradise Father are associated with the souls of mankind. With the passing of time, we could see that his human mind was increasingly discerning that while he lived in the, his life in the flesh, in spirit on his shoulders rested the responsibility of the universe. So even at 12, not quite 13, you were right, Millie, it's actually 12, not quite 13, they said. So this was right before his 13th birthday. Right, and he, the whole responsibility of the whole universe was on his shoulders at this point. Okay. Thus okay. ends the career of the Nazareth lad, and begins the narrative of that adolescent youth, the increasingly self-conscious divine human, who now begins the contemplation of his word world career as he strives to integrate his expanding life purpose with the desires of his parents and his obligations to his family in the society of his day and age. So next time we'll take up his young manhood then, right? Uh, and that will be, um, well actually we're going to go into Jesus at Jerusalem. That's page, that's page 125 next time. We'll do that next Sunday. So let's say a closing prayer and we'll end for today. Father, uh, thank you for this information that you've given us, this revelation. What a wonderful gift to be able to study this and try to comprehend it. We thank you for our blessings in this life and these teachings, and we help, hope that we might use these teachings to help others. Rachel, bless these people that listen to this at home, that they might grow with our study and continue growing with us. We thank you and we give you the praise. In your son's name, Jesus. Amen. Mm -hmm. Thank you for joining us. Let me stop the recording. Y'all, please come and see us again.